Hello, I'm Johnny Reinhardt, the director of the American Festival of Microtonal Music for 40 years, moving now in the direction of Microtonal University, which is affectionately known as Moo. Uh, Moo had this epic microtonal guitar festival on October 24th that just passed, 2021. We thought this might be a great way to introduce the non moo world uh, into what we're doing here. Um, follow the signage and you'll you know find links to join Moo to find out the schedule of microtonal courses, classes, instructions, improvs, uh, presentations, composer forums, parties on Sundays only. Come to whichever ones you want to get recordings of all the ones you missed. 12 months. Let me tell you who's going to be here today. Michael Vick, who edited this particular recording for you, for the non moo world. We call it phase two. And uh, we're going to have uh, Brendan Burns, Dave Fashinsky, Dave Dornig. Neil Havistick, Al Justo, Melavitis, Wim Hugerwerf, Stephen James Taylor, John Catler, and John Schneider as a bonus. Now, the guitar has been leading the world in microtonality in terms of, you know, favorability as an instrument. And we're going to have these festivals for every instrument. In fact, the next one is uh, for flutes. Anyway, I hope to see some of you. I hope you have some Sundays available. It's inexpensive. It's a community. It's a new platform. We just added a new virtual building, in fact, in the university. For now, as someone once very proudly called an honorary guitarist in New York City, I present to you Michael Vick, faculty member of Moo. <laughs>
All right. So microtonal guitar. Like we say, 12-tone equal temperaments microtonal. Get out. Maybe it is. Who really cares? It's a conformist mindset. Let's break free. I go fretless, but also, hey, I like those guitars too. So let's move on. Brendan Burns. This is a guy I probably heard about maybe 10 years ago, you know, with YouTube. There's so many things going on. But I was like, hey, man, this guy sounds actually pretty good playing a 22-tone guitar, etc. So um, I know he's put out a ton of albums, and he's pushing a uh, microtonal guitar in his own way. Um, you know, I, I like to look at it, for me, music self-expression. I have my own self-expression. I don't like to conform. Now this guy, Brendan, let's hear what he's going to do. But to me, it sounds like he likes to stay on the outside of where things are, but still have it where it sounds for the people. All right, Brendan. Thanks very much, uh, Michael. That was a great piece, by the way, too. Um, yeah, thanks, Johnny, for having me. And uh, nice to see some familiar faces. And um, I see a lot of familiar names. Uh, I haven't met all of you, but uh, nice to virtually meet you. Um, yeah, like Michael said, I've, uh, I've put out a number of uh, microtonal albums over the last 10 years. Um, the last one in particular was uh, really just focused on microtonal guitar. I didn't do any singing. I tried to use as few synthesizers as possible. It's, it's very guitar based. Um, the second half of the album is just, you know, it's mostly just uh, electric guitar. Um, you know, sometimes pieces for multiple layers of electric guitar, but, um, you know, pretty stripped down to what I usually do. So. Uh, I'm going to play a piece today that's on my uh, 27 Edo guitar. Um, as Michael mentioned, I've done a lot with 22, um, and in the last uh, year or so, I switched over to 27 just to change it up. And uh, it was always a tuning that I was really attracted to. Um, I just thought it sounded great on guitar. I, I tested it out on, you know, a virtual guitar, uh, you know, contact instrument, and I just thought it re really worked well with the timbre. So. I gave it a shot and I've been really happy with the tuning. Um, so I'm gonna play a piece today that's, uh, it's already on YouTube. So, um, you know, maybe you haven't seen it already, maybe you have, but uh, this will just be a, a different version of it. And um, yeah, it's it's about three minutes long and uh, I will uh, get set up to play it. So this is the guitar, by the way. Uh, made by um, the the neck was made by Ron Sword, which I'm sure a lot of you know. Not everybody knows, and uh, you know it's just a cheap Ibanez guitar, but uh, gets the job done. And I've been really happy with it. So, um, everybody hear the guitar? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So this is just called Twenty Seven Edo Etude. Um, here we go. Thank you. 
Yep. Love that last chord, Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I like that last chord too. It's uh, I, in the YouTube video. I uh, mentioned why, um, or I mentioned that I didn't know why I liked it, and uh, a lot of people weighed in with some really insightful, uh, you know, reasons why that chord is cool. So you can check out the comment section for a lot of people's perspective. Oh, and by the way, Stephen Weigel, uh, who I just noticed is here, he transcribed this piece. Uh, so the tab is actually available. Thanks to Stephen. He did a great job. Um, so that's available on YouTube as well. So if you ever get a 27 Nito guitar, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's available. Hey, Brendan, I always like to ask, why, why 27? What are, you, what are you seeing in that tuning? Um, well, the, uh, I like the fact that there's two types of minor thirds that are, that are really you know, in, in tune in a great way, you know, close to just intonation. Um, I like the fact that there's a, a 13th harmonic that is really close, um, you know, to J.I., which which I love. Um, there's two types of minor sevens. It, it seems like there's, you know, there's just a lot of flavors of, of uh, a lot of very useful intervals. And when I was playing it on a, you know, a virtual instrument, I was just shocked at how many chords sounded good to me. You know, even if it wasn't, you know, dead on J.I. stuff, even just the, the way the, the chords resonated. It just really spoke to me. Uh, it was just a, a sound I really liked, and um, you know, I think when I was trying to choose between tunings to to do, I I, I tried a bunch, you know, just on a keyboard, uh, and that one just really jumped out to me. And um, yeah, uh, I, 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 I just oh, want to interject interject here in response to uh, what Peter had asked earlier about uh, violin players always having fretless and guitar players are having training wheels called frets. Your answer, what you just said, really explains one of the reasons why guitar is guitar, yeah. right? <laughs> right. Is, is you, you can get all of these chords and you get them every time. Whereas on a fretless instrument, that would be really, really hard to, to nail it every time, you know? Yeah, absolutely. To get it accurately. And, yeah. and there is something about the, the, the error, you know, the fact that it's not de dead on J.I., that, you know, it's something that you wouldn't necessarily be able to tune by ear on the fly. That uh, That is a special thing about guitar. Yeah, I agree. And uh, actually, I, if I can quote uh, Stephen, <laughs> you, you said something. I met you, uh, I don't know, five, six years ago now, and um, you said uh, one of the best things about microtonality is that we get our major chords back. And um, I really feel that way about, um, you know, this tuning as well. I mean, a major chord, it's uh, it's in tune, but in sort of a different way. So, it, it you know, it sounds fresh. It doesn't sound like the regular 12 volt. And, and you didn't have to go to the 19th century to get it. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> hey, Brendan. Yes. I, I, I really like your work. Um, oh, thank I just you. wanted to show everybody. Can, can you see this? This yeah. was his last album. It's it's on my list, dude. It sits right close to the CD player. Oh, that's awesome. And Thank I you. wish I could turn on the jazz station and hear what you just did, because to me, that's modern chord melody. I mean, that's what it is. It's a shit. But you can't hear that, unfortunately. Yeah, well, maybe someday yeah. we'll, we'll yeah. all be on those stations. We're working on <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, but thank you, Neil. So I believe up next is the one and only Dave Frzynski, a.k.a. Fuse. Um, now, I've known Dave from playing the uh, Fretless Guitar Festival up in New York, but this this guy's global. If you don't know who he is, uh, check him out, and you're about to, and check out his band Keith. I mean, hell, that's maybe 10, 15 years ago, but um, that's one of the first albums. I, I knew Screaming Headless Torsos, but Keith was the one where – he was going full on microtonal and stretching. So uh, he can speak for himself, Dave Frusinski. Uh Thanks so much for having us. Great to be in this great company. It's amazing. Can everybody hear me? I'm having some technical difficulties. Um, to be honest though, or maybe it's just me playing normal guitar out of tune. Keith is pretty 12 tone. <laughs> But I always loved, um, I, have, I have to apologize. Uh, the only way I can play is I have to switch a setting, but then I can't talk. So let me just talk a little bit. I don't know if you can hear this, maybe just quietly, but I always loved like bending. So 
So I, I think maybe I was microtonal before I even heard the word. <laughs> um, and um, so, uh, yeah, I, my journey kind of started, I think in a way many of ours do, is that um, I was in college and I forget what it was, but I heard, I don't know, um, so-called non non-Western music. Can we even say that? Is that even politically correct these days? <laughs> um, I think it was an Arabic call to prayer or something, you know, and I showed up with my stupid little 12 note per octave ruler and realized a lot of notes were not there. So that's why I, how I realized there was a whole other universe um, happening. Um, I was lucky enough to do a well, we rehearsed in Morocco in 1992. I was invited to be part of this North, South, East, West symposium. So kind of in a way for the wrong reasons because it looked good, but they got these players from downtown, you know, downtown New York, LA, Paris, and we were the backing band for 10 Moroccan folklore groups. It was really, really amazing. I mean, we were rehearsed like six, eight, ten hours a day, but we didn't care, it was amazing. Um, and then we performed at the World Fair in uh, Seville. Obviously, a whole lot of notes flying around. Um, and merely because I was the guitar player, it was very, very important for the Moroccans, for, for me to know that Jimi Hendrix came to Morocco. I was like, okay. <laughs> But uh, that gave me an idea. I mean, many people celebrate the uh, dead Hendrix. I mean, his music will live on, but I was wondering what would happen if I celebrated a possible living Hendrix. Maybe he's retired, living in um, Marrakesh or Casablanca, and every now and then he would go downtown and rock the Casbah. So uh, I thought, well, what if I took all these grooves and Western grooves and mixed them with... At first, I was really more interested in Middle Eastern, Indian, and East Asian inflections. But then, just like the blues, you can't get those without microtones. So again, I'm sorry, I'm technologically ha hampered. I forgot my microphone. Uh, so here's a little, I guess for many of you, probably pretty boring quarter tone thing. In E major, it's a Chinese melody that I transcribed. Um, I'm not sure this is the correct way to describe it, but I guess in boring jazz chord scale speak, it's E major, quarter sharp four, quarter flat, major seven. So here's a short little thingy. <laughs>
Very nice, Dave. It did clip a little when everything got going, but all your music came through, so no problem. Sorry about that. On top of that, my delay uh, crapped out. It wouldn't actually stop delaying, but hey, what can you do? So no thanks problem. for listening. Yeah, I love that piece. So. Any questions for, for Dave? Yeah, Dave, what was what was the original Chinese piece written for? Any particular instrument? Yeah. Hey, man, how are you? Got up this morning. That's my standard answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In my age, that's um, a good thing. Yeah. Oof. Um, I hear that. Um, the melody, uh, Longing for the Mortal World. Um, it's, I'm going to butcher the name, Guzeng. Um, if you know what a Japanese koto is, it's a zither, and I guess it's kind of the mother of all zithers. I think it's the oldest zither on the planet. So um, that was from the Chao Zhu school. Apparently there are eight schools of guzang music, and my teacher gave me a bunch of um, <clears throat> different ones to listen to, and she told me I naturally chose the one that was most out of tune. Surprise, surprise. Hey, Foos, good seeing you. Good seeing you, man. Wonderful, wonderful work, and uh, I love Thanks. that volume pedal stuff you were doing. Thanks. Uh, how's, that, um, how's that keyboard working for you? It works, it makes you think differently. It, it rewires your brain. Thinking along 12, 12 vectors instead of two. Yeah. I was trying to get one for Berkeley, but. Oh, that would have been nice. They weren't too interested in a controller that plays out of tune. Yeah. I'll keep trying. <laughs> Don't give up. <laughs> but, but really, really nice stuff. So that was just quarter tones? Yeah, sorry, just boring old quarter tones. Wow. I mean, you know, within reason, as you mentioned on fretless, there's always a little you know, give and take, even with the so-called in-tune chords, whatever that means these days. Right. right. And the more I do this, I, I, I'm starting to realize I'm kind of naturally playing major thirds slightly flat. Um, this neutral seven is kind of interesting. I'm wondering if they were trying to go for an overtone flat seven. Uh, no, that would be flatter. No, it's, it's between flat seven and major seven. And it's not a fluke. If you listen to the recording, it's it's the same pitches hit the same way over and over and over again. Is, is that the closest system you can find to accommodate the uh, the original Chinese intonation? Um, I mean, I'm a I'm a I'm a uh, equal tempered guy. I study with Joe Maneri, 20, 72 notes per octave. Um, so I kind of work with quarter tones. Uh, if I need more, I add more. Um, I encourage my students to try that way because that's something I, I, I thought, you know, it was a little harsh with Joe Maneri. You know, the very first class, he was like, check this out. Ooh, ooh, that was a 12th tone. Did you hear it? Cool, right? And we're all sitting there like, <laughs> so, I start with, you know, training wheels, quarter tones to give people a chance. And then I keep pushing the envelope. So I've been able to get alum and students to do some of the 128 note stuff I did with Jack DeJeanette and Philip Gershlauer. Um, my student, Georgi Mikadze from the uh, Republic of Georgia. I, I started him out the same way with, you know, Julian Carrillo, quarter tone string quartet and an Arabic melody. And then I encouraged them, you know, here is just one system. There's so many. And so he took my concept, went home, transcribed stuff, and he used his own system. This was uh, uh, with sense. So it's like all plus and minus numbers all over the place. And I'm not sure if he's thinking specific overtone series and so forth. He's just trying to, um, really document the actual pitch. And then he uses a pitch set, set from a traditional melody and he wrote whole tunes. And he chose a number of the, the on the record, there's about four or five traditional melodies that we interpret in a 
pretty straightforward chorale. But then he used those tunings to write full tunes. So, uh, you know, from Berkeley having nothing to that, I mean, has been beyond what I ever imagined. So, oh, and we've started the first microtonal minor. Wow. So, is is that going to change the world? And there'll be uh, microtonal radio stations. I don't know. I think it's. I think things will be changed if we go underground like that. What's that band, King Gizzard and the Izzard Wizard? They're an indie band, and they do stuff. With the microtonal flying banana. That record. They play that stuff, and wow, they sell out the O2 Arena Arena in London. No, Dave, I think that's the way there's going to be change. You're absolutely making a difference because Ben Johnston taught a whole generation of people who have gone and taught another generation. You're planting the seeds. Keep going, man. It works. That's why we're here today because of what the cats did 40 years ago. John, I mean, I, I saw your name like 20, 30 years ago. It's like talking to God. <laughs> but I just... Yeah, I'm that old. And and Stephen and so many of you, but it's like, wow, I'm planting seeds. Oof. They grow slowly. I mean, with Georgi, wow, 10 years, 10 years of him coming in as a very talented student and encouraging him to do his own thing. And he went to grad school and then he got a grant and he went home and and then we did a recording and we had everything ready and we were going to go on tour. And then COVID happened. Oh, we're going to try and pick up the pieces, but it's like, wow. I wish I had, I wish I could do less gardening and more playing. <laughs> we all do, but keep doing it. Do it all. You never know what's going to hit. All right. Well, I look up to you guys. But thank you, Dave. All right. So let's go to <laughs> Neil Haverstick. Now, again, I mean, a one of a kind. This is one of the early guys I heard about. You know, you had John Cattler then, uh, on the guitar. You know, John Cattler, Neil Haverstig. Neil's written uh, some books on microtonality, 19 Tone and New Beginning. What was that, 20 years ago now or more? But who cares? Let's not talk about age. Um, but uh, Neil's also played my Fretless Guitar Festival. He sounded different the two times he played. He's one of those guys who's got out of stuff, but it's so broad, he can sound different. And I respect that. Those are the best players, um, even if you got one style. Um, so, Neil Haverstick, look him up online. You'll be blown away. I'll turn it over right now, though, and you'll catch him live. Neil? Hey, guys, this is a, a real honor. You know, my mom, she always supported my career, and she said to me once, you meet a lot of interesting people, and I do. And a lot of them are right here. And that makes up for all the shitty gigs I've done, believe me. You know, dead, dead serious. And sorry, David, I went and play a private party last night, plugged my acoustic guitar in. I've had the pickup in it for 45 years and it malfunctioned. So it happens right on a gig, but I survived. Okay. So I know we don't have a lot of time. That's um, life, I hear you. <laughs> I want to do a couple things. So we're talking about roots. So can you all see this? It's hard rock from the Middle East by a group called the Devil's Anvil. This is the original album. I read a review of that in a magazine in 1967 and I ordered it. And that's where I first heard the oud and Arabic singing. It was a mix of Middle Eastern and rock. It was a bunch of guys playing around Greenwich Village. And Felix Papillardi, who went on to produce Scream and play with Mountain. He produced that and he played bass on it and sang one tune. He was doing A&R work for Columbia. So he got these guys a one record deal. So I didn't know anything about microtones, but I heard the oud and that was the end of it. I, I loved it the second I heard it. Still do, I've got two ouds now. So then the next year, this is the original flyer. I saw Ravi Shankar in St. Louis with Alaraka. Um, Orchestra, $5, <laughs> upper balcony, $3 and $2. So, and I still didn't know about microtones, but then you start, when you're a kid, you hear about quarter tones, you know, which exist, but 
people would apply that to just generally mean anything, you know, that was microtonal. So I saw those two guys, I saw Ravi Shankar and in 66, I heard Jeff Beck play over under sideways down on the radio. And that really did it. Even though it was 12 tone, I remember thinking I had the wrong station. Like I thought it was some kind of weird Arabic station or something. And then a friend said, that's a Yardbirds. I was sold. So here I am. If I ever see Jeff Beck, I'm going to tell him that. He's probably sick of people saying that. He'd probably punch you, but what the hell? Okay, so what else? Let me let me do a couple other things here before I play. So just for fun, can you see this picture? That's Bonnie Nelson and her band. This is 1977. I was playing country music with her. She had a contract with International Harvester Trucks. It's called Trans Star Rose. So we played truck shows. So I played the real shit. Uh, we played the WWVA Jamboree in Wheeling, West Virginia, oldest country music show outside of the Grand Ole Opry. And then I played at her dad's club for three months on, in South Denver. And he, uh, you ever hear of the Texas Mafia? Probably not outside of Colorado. Well, they're, they're a bunch of bad boys. And he was a Texas Mafia goon, alcoholic redneck. And he wore a 38 every night on his hip. Never saw him without it. So it was. I like to tell my students when you're playing Patsy Cline at one in the morning in a place like that, that's the shit. That's where you learn how to do that. Because I played so bluesy. And then I got fired, which was fine. <laughs> but I survived it. <laughs> you know? um, what else? I got a bunch of stuff here I wanted to do. That'll probably do it for now. So I have played a lot of styles, as Mike said. And I made, you know, I made a career out of it. Somehow I survived. Uh, last uh, October 8th was my 50th anniversary of quitting college, driving up to Kansas City and opening for the Steve Miller band and somehow still doing it. And on the 8th this year, I was on a plane to Boston. I played there a couple of weeks ago. And any of you guys in Boston, you want to get a hold of a guy named Alex Limsky. He does really good work, way out stuff. And he pays you pretty good, speaking of paying. <laughs> I was very pleased with what he handed me after the gig. But that don't happen all the time. Okay, so I have a lot of different guitars. Uh, tempered, I have 19, uh, 24, let me think, 31, 34, and 36 equal temperaments. And then I have a 22-tone guitar where I kind of designed a tuning based off of Wendy Carlos's uh, Just Imaginings on her uh, Beauty and the Beast album. It's got the 16 harmonics from the 16th to the 32nd harmonic and six more notes, which I can never remember. And uh, a luthier here in town, Brian Dekabach, fretted it for me. Great job. And then because of Herb Wilson, my last guitar is 24 notes of the octave, but it's all the harmonics from 24 to 48. So it's very cool. And Irv told me in a letter once, he said, that's my favorite guitar tuning. So I got it and I haven't played much of it yet. So my next one is gonna be all the harmonics from 32 to 64, but I just don't have time to play them all at this time. So what I have been doing when I travel, uh, you can't take all your guitars. So I've been taking the fretless, been working a lot on that. So I have a pretty good fretless repertoire with looping, um, which is a real lifesaver. And all my pedals fit in my flight case, which is just great. Can't beat that. But a few years ago, when I went to Boston, I took a big distortion unit. They actually called me out at security and said, what is this? They thought it was some kind of bomb. They really did. <laughs> so I mailed it back FedEx, FedEx or something. So I didn't want to try to get on a plane again with that damn thing. So what I'm going to do today, it's all set up. I got my loops going. I'm going to do a, a blues called Alien Blues Man. And that's really my route outside, you know, the ventures and whatever was on the radio. Um, when I got into blues in the early 70s, I'm, I still love it. I think my favorite blues tune of all is Backdoor Man by Howlin' Wolf. It can still bring chills up my spine every time I hear it. And I got to see Wolf and Muddy and Albert King, and we opened a show for B.B. King. So I've been around that most of my life. And of course, it's microtonal as all get out you know, even on a 12-tone guitar. But it's funny, I've read a lot of interviews with blues guys, and none of them talk about the microtones, per se. But you listen to Albert King, and forget it. 
nobody can play like that. He just plays four or five notes and they're all over the place. And it's totally, you know, intuitive microtonality. So this is my $200 Ibanez seven string, which just sounds killer. Uh, uh, my friend Brian defretted it. It's it, it just a wonderful instrument. So I got my two pedal boards on the floor and I'm using a power screamer uh, distortion unit that I first saw Fuzinski do at the, at the Fretless Fest in 2006. I emailed him and said, what is that? So I bought one, best, best one I've ever used. So here's what I'm gonna do. I got my loop set up. I got three Boss 40 second loopers and they're my little orchestra. And then I mix them down into a couple other Boss loopers. So I'm gonna get the loop set up and then do a little solo and fade it out. And we'll punt from there. Okay, so here we go. Hey, there we go. Stretch it. You know, that's a lot longer piece usually, so it wouldn't have went so quickly. It develops more. Um, I played an awful lot of blues, and, you know, I think it's one of the most malleable forms. You can take a 12-bar blues and play pretty pentatonic, or you can write dozens of chord changes, and it works just as well. And I played a lot of the different re – there's a lot of regional styles of blues you know, most people, you know, Clapton, Hendrix, Joe Bonamassa, Stevie Ray Vaughan, yeah, 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 but there's so many ways to play blues. And I've been really getting into the more Delta sound, uh, the one chord thing. Of course, Jimi Hendrix was the maestro of that. And there was a comment I read once from uh, Sam Phillips, who owns Sun Records. And he said about Howlin' Wolf, this is where the soul of man never dies. And I think no matter what style of music I play, I try to I try to see if I can do that. That's not always possible. But I remember I was in a music store years ago, just reading some Hank Williams lyrics, a, a rambling man. And I got a chill up my spine just from reading the lyrics. That's what I want. If I can get that out of music, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty satisfied. So, you know, there it is. Glad to be here. Looking forward to hearing everybody else. And I put my email up. Oh, I'm sorry about the camera. Yeah, I was too late. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Yeah. All right, great. So, yeah, this is David Dornig. Um, again, I, you know, I heard about him a couple of years ago. Um, you know, Johnny's known about him. This, this stuff I've heard is wonderful. It, it has kind of, uh, you know, uh, 
game style music, free jazz, a little hint of Zappa, some of the stuff I've heard, uh, you know, Mario Brothers going around. Um, so yeah, it's kind of right up my alley. I like all kinds of stuff. And I um, also know he studied at the Vienna Music Institute. So he's got the brain for this stuff too, especially with all those frets. So um, I'll turn it over to you, David. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, with the brain, it's this, uh, it's not usually, uh, really, um, that much of a, of advantage, I think. So I'm going to play a tune from 2000, or maybe two, two tunes in a kind of a medley, maybe, um, from 2014, where the brain was not with the music, uh, with the tuning system, at least. So I had this, uh, 31 tone guitar. Um, and I, I understood the tuning system. Yeah. But, uh, uh, my ears were not used to it. So it was this really special time, you know, where, uh, you get to explore it all over again. Uh, it's like it was in 12 tone equal temperament, all those chords, those wonderful rich chords, which you didn't know w until they were under your hands. And then you recognize them everywhere. And then, and it was the same thing with the 31 equal temperament. It was like, ah, oh, this is like a, a new, new experience, a new uh, challenge. And yeah, I mean, it still is. But now I know the intervals better. It, it's, it, they become, uh, I don't know how you say it, um, familiar. Yeah. And yeah, I'm, so I'm going to play something where they weren't familiar at all. So you will hear a lot of stuff that is sounds even for 12 tone years very familiar because i was like latching on to stuff that's uh that i i can understand and then trying some things which i wasn't used to and it was uh yeah really interesting so no it's not it's not really interesting and any uh, but i'm play so i play some um yeah so this is the guitar it has Lots of strings, lots of frets. It's 31 equal temperament. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Very, very nice. Uh, yeah, thank you. And thank you for, for having me. It was, uh, I don't want to say unexpectedly, but uh, it was very interesting and surprisingly so. I, I learned so many new voices and uh, sounds here and guitar players I uh, maybe heard the name of or saw something. But yeah, it was really a pleasure hearing all those performances. And thanks for having me, Johnny. It was, and <laughs> everyone involved, of course. Does anybody have any questions for David? Because that was a very special performance. I didn't know if anybody had something right now. I sure do. I'd love to hear the open strings of that guitar. Yeah, that all eight question. of them. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's really boring, John. I'm really sorry. It's all, uh, so it's actually tuned in equally uh, 31 equally tempered fourths, but it has a, a capo. So the fourths uh, are broken by a fifth. So it's like... It's an E, A, D, and then again a D, A, um, G, C, and F. Huh. Yes. Yeah, I, I wanted to have a low uh, E string for the bass parts. So, yeah. And hey, David, is, is that written out? Um, what I played right now, that, yeah, that well, piece. Yeah, well, uh, some of it is written out. Yes, uh, it's it's it was snippets and stuff from pieces. Yeah, I, I mean, I sh I did there uh, were great performances here. I should have practiced. I just wasn't really <laughs> ready for that. I, <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, some of it is, but it was kind of a improvised medley, if you want to call it that. Uh, David, I uh, did hear 31 tone uh, riffs, you know, from my past. Yeah. You know, really? it, it, you know that it, we, we've been talking lately a lot about zonk, that each uh -huh. tuning system has its own zonk. Yes. And, you know, that 31 tone equal temperament, you know, um, D, 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 38.7 yeah. to me, sense, you know, that to me is very natural. Oh, you know, yeah, I mean, sure. people, have, if you live with a tuning system, you know, to the point where it's no longer referential to equal temperament, you know, which yeah. is something you were talking about. Then, sure. you know, it, it's, a, it's, but it does have its own sound world, though. Of course it does. You know, hey, hey it, guys, hang on. Yeah. I got this just ready. Reinhardt, you're going to freak out. I've got an original copy of Cow People. <laughs> but yeah, I got one too. Do you really? <laughs> yeah, I'm vinyl. I never opened it. <laughs> and I read about Catler and Guitar Player in 1984, about the time this came out. So, you know, I remember saying, oh, cool, microtones. But, I, you know, I didn't know what it was. But there, this is, a, and Reinhardt's on here, too. Um, yeah. The tune Cow yeah. People is a riot. It's it's a 31-tone kind of country piece. And <laughs> Well, it's polymicrotonal because it has quarter tones that go against the Oh, no kidding. Yeah. So it's not I just 31-tone? Played... No, it's polymicrotonal. In fact, he taught me the term. He's on here now, actually. Uh, he taught me the term. So, like, I was playing on the bassoon. A boom, 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 a boom, a boom, 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 and he's going, all right, da, 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 Another quick question for David. What's it like working with the Clavitron, with D. Silton and, and yeah. Georg Vogel? Do yeah. you guys just jam? Oh, well, uh, sometimes, if, if time allows. But usually it's like uh, we work on a compos composition and we, uh, uh, we share it with the other guys. And uh, so Georg uh, or me put out a composition and we... Uh, yeah, sometimes not even uh, 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 one that is complete yet. And we play snippet by snippet and we practice and uh, and play as long as it takes to get them sounding OK. And uh, that uh, I mean, the, the, the distance uh, between sounding the piece sounds all right and uh, sounds really good is usually uh, a few months of practicing and a few years of playing it. Yeah. So 
but that's that's the thing but it's usually compositions and we we sometimes take parts of those compositions and improvise with them to get to, to know them it's not like it's not muscle memory but you get to understand the parts and sometimes we do that that we take a part and we do also improvisation over it or take some uh, rhythmic permutation of it that uh, like when something is in seven tuplets we do like an 11 tuplet uh, permutation of it and uh, modulate around with seven tuplets and 11 tuplets uh, or like three 11 tuplets are the new uh, pulse and so and and, ev and it always gets faster and so uh, or something like that to really get to know and play play actually with it but as as it's so time consuming to get the pieces to sound just close to what we uh, uh, imagine as composers most of the time we just try to play the pieces <laughs> when you guys uh, play all these festivals uh, do you have charts or you just no music in front of you um uh, i i don't get what you mean uh you have been playing in public quite yes, often yeah. with d mm -hmm. silton this wonderful band everybody if you <laughs> don't know it it's a 31 tone clavitone and him and drums <laughs> it's the ma it's it's the future <laughs> that's I, all there is I to think, it i think i heard that band. you know the you knowing the band john is uh yeah is my heart filled with joy i i really like uh, i really love your book was so inspired this this book we talked about it earlier it was so inspiring <laughs> to me and i worked i used it in my master thesis also and it was uh yeah, and uh, also your music, of course, as a guitar player and as a musician, was very, very inspiring. Inspiring, and you knowing my band and liking it—that's really cool to me. I love oh, it's it. Very kind. It's very kind. Uh, yeah. I think I heard your band in Salzburg four years ago. Were you were you at the Microfest, the Ecumelic Festival in Salzburg, yeah. four mm -hmm. years ago? Yeah, that, yeah. Was it? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I heard you then, and it was quite what what what, it, what struck me is that it felt like the some of your um, structural gr uh, harmonic grids come could have come from uh, t twelve tone ideas. Um, in in that you 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 weren't it wasn't so much um, jazz oriented and chord chart this chord chart mm. with like a finger solo finger style, but it was it had a uh, um, a structure that reminded me more of a the, those beautiful 12 tone uh, harmonic progressions that you hear. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. I, but tell me how you get those those kinds of, uh, how, how do you conceive of those uh, those structures? Um, it's, a, it's a mix of uh, techniques. It's basically, we think very, uh, um, how do you say, spectral. It's all, we all relate it to the, to the harmonic series to the uh, whole whole number ratios so that's the way we, way we visualize it and that goes very well with the concept of rhythm we have with all the uh, entuplet time signatures and stuff so we all visualize every aspect of the music uh, at least rhythm and harmony and melody uh, in terms of whole number ratios but then there's also serial techniques like 31 tone rows or something like that that's what I heard. Yeah. Yeah. The spectral sounds can become very um, much like a static pitch field. And what you were doing moved, it moved very nicely. Yeah, it's because you don't have, to, if, if it's a spectral approach, you don't have to stay at one root. You can exactly. have very complex time uh, modulating spectral structures like Ben Johnston in his pieces has. And uh, also, um, you don't have to play the root at all. So sometimes a very simple spectral structure becomes very complex if you suggest that it's that the lowest note um, is not the root, uh, or if in your head it's not the root, but it's a, you just suggest it as a root, and then some simple structure is complex all of a sudden. I, I get you. Yeah. 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 I, you uh, can have uh, spectral uh, interchanges of more than one uh, thought of root in one chord and so this it's poly struck uh, spectral chords if you want to uh, that's a very interesting way of uh, visualizing pitch organization because it's just what it is in your head what uh, the sound that comes out can be interpreted in so many ways of course but yeah that's kind of ways inter interesting ways of thinking about it to me and, and likewise, David, I wanted to compliment you on um, on the, uh, the, the the scope of the 
of the resources in 31 that you took advantage of in that piece, from the most okay. consonant, ultra consonant to the ultra dissonant, um, mm. and going fluidly uh, amongst them. I have a similar guitar, and you're inspiring me to dig deeper into it because you've obviously spent a million more hours on it uh, than I have. But I have a nine string that Ron Sword built the 31. Yeah, I saw I saw a video a while back. Yeah. Oh, okay. Was, yeah. yeah. Very, very, uh, very. Um, I don't know, flowing uh, kind of. Uh, like an open tuning sound, I think it was really cool. Yeah, yeah, I had mostly mm -hmm. open, open fourths and stuff. But, but your your playing really inspires me. I just wanted to oh, compliment really, you again. That's great. Thank you. How deep a dive you've taken into it. Yeah, I wish I had practiced because there's all these accomplished guitar players, and I was thinking like, oh, maybe I'll I, I make it as soon as possible and stuff. But this is a really great thing. <laughs> do you, Do you find that? Um, I find that if I practice something and I get it under my fingers, yeah. if I walk away for a couple of months, it doesn't come right. <laughs> Maybe yeah. it's just, you know, I've been around too long, you know, but it, 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 no, it doesn't no, just no. come right back. Yeah. No, with me neither. I have pieces with silk. Uh, we say Zilton to yeah. you say D Zilton, some of uh, you, I don't Zilton. know. We say Zilton. <laughs> anyway, we have pieces. If I don't play them for like two months or so, I can't play them anymore and we played a concert in Salzburg <laughs> last, uh, this summer and it was like uh, we played a week before Georg and me and, and Valentin we played a week before uh, a concert in Vienna and uh, Georg had so many things to do and he didn't have time to practice during the week which should be fine because we played on Sunday and the next concert was on Sunday and he uh, he played two or three pieces he played uh, su such shit in the beginning because it, yeah, he hadn't practiced the whole week and it wasn't, he, he couldn't play it. Uh, so we, we uh, yeah. If, I mean, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for <laughs> sharing that. That's like therapy no, no, no. for me, okay? Because it's like, I thought I was the only one. You know, no, the, the, no, 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 no. <laughs> if, it's, uh, if it's hard and some pieces we play are just like, uh, too, I mean, you could say they are too hard for me because, uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I can play them, but it takes a very big effort. And with those pieces, yeah, you have to practice them right before you play them. Yeah. That's the thing. We call that high <laughs> maintenance repertoire. It is high maintenance. <laughs> yes, thank you. That makes sense. All right, well, brilliant. So maybe practice next time and you'll get yeah. even more compliments. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a good idea. No, beautiful. All right, so um, I got to note that Wim has arrived. Wim was part of the first session but Wim is here now so I think we're gonna take a detour over to you if that's okay Wim. Okay that's fine. Well um, I'm honored to be there but uh, I should say I should say in my um, the most the most important project I did in in, uh, in the last years concerning microtonal music was mainly in quarter tone music. So I had um, I became I became like a kind of a virtuoso on 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 written pieces. Uh, I remember the last time I played in New York, I did the I did the full Haba piece for quarter tone guitar, and um, and uh, the last project was for a very a very huge piece for two quarter tone fretted guitars. So I have one I have one guitar here now. And um, this is actually um, this is actually a guitar which I ordered from a, from a, um, a real serious guitar builder to have to have like a, a very good instrument and not um, like what most people do like take a cheap guitar and uh, and put extra frets on it and that's it. So this was a guitar which costed me around like uh, uh, five thousand euros, which is a very this is a good price for a guitar, and uh, I wanted to have it because because the the project was very serious. We played in many many halls, and uh, and I would just wanted to have a, a really good sound. So the it made me <clears throat> it made me think a lot about quarter tone music because what you what you hear and when you play uh, when you play uh, for instance Alois Haba on quarter tone guitar, you feel that it is. Um, that is a mixture of of two two temperaments which are just a quarter tone apart. You know, he has a, he has twelve tone equal, and then he has another twelve tone equal which fits which fits just 
fits in because it is a, a quarter tone lower or higher. And this is actually what is what this music is all concerned. So all the chords, every time there is a there is a, an interval between two between real quarter tone sounds, they both belong to the quarter to the twelve tone equal. And there is no there is no search for harmony uh, in between notes belonging to quarter tone and notes belonging to twelve tone equal. And uh, this composition, which we did a few years ago with two quarter tone fretted guitars, is really a piece which, which, uh, which is based upon like a harmonic structure in which the quality of each interval is used in such a way that, uh, that um, the, the, the non dissonant intervals from the quarter tone system they really fit into the harmony. So you have like, like, uh, intervals of three quarter tones, five quarter tones, and the whole, the whole thing sounds very, very, um, uh, very well balanced without, without having the, the feeling that you are playing in a 12 tone equal, which has been compromised by adding quarter tones. So my, my last, uh, I, I prepared you something for today because, uh, it's no use. It's no use trying to play a full quarter tone guitar piece because it's it's always hellishly difficult, and uh, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time, but I've been thinking about this this way in which in which twelve tone equal and quarter tone uh, belong to each other, and I tried. I did some experiment to generate a scale, uh, starting with a. A real quarter tone interval, which is very, very balanced. So I tried with first with uh, 550 cents, which is the, the 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 physical fourth, which is very, very uh, consonant. And then I tried to generate a scale with with 250 and one with 150. And I don't remember which interval finally worked because it, it some time ago I didn't have time to really prepare the the whole thinking. But I found that it came up to a scale of seven notes in which, uh, in which the, the A was a quarter tone flat, the E was a quarter tone flat, and the B was a quarter tone flat. So this gave me a kind of, a kind of C scale, which didn't have any major or minor uh, tendency. So it, it is a completely neutral scale. And I said, I said to myself, well, Let's let's just take this scale and call it, as we say in French, do re mi fa sol la si do. You know, so my so if I play this scale on the, on the, this neutral scale on the guitar, so I tuned normal normally the the guitar is tuned E A D G B A G B E right the, the normal scale which would like which would sound like um, something like this. Uh, I can't, no, it's uh, just the way I tune the guitar, that's like I, I adapted every note of the open strings to this neutral C scale, and that gave me the resonance of the open string, which sounds like this. Okay. So already you hear in the open strings that the, the, the chords, if I play a chord like this, which is like, which I just call now, D G B E, you know, it it's it already has a very nice balanced consonance between quarter tone and, and equal. You don't you cannot actually tell any longer which tone belongs to 12 tone equal and which is really quarter tone. Okay, so when I when I, I will try to, to make some kind of improvisation uh, using the C the C neutral scale. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. So, so when I yes. when I have the, this scale would sound like this. It's um, it's kind of familiar to the Arabic rust scale, but it hasn't that exactly the same intervals. But uh,
as the ambience. And you, uh, so I think this is this is interesting stuff to to ask someone to make a composition in this using this system, and um, so that was the the the, the neutral scale of of uh, do re mi fa sol si do for me, and uh, so if it if it's set in a score, I cut it here on my on my tablet, it will look something if you can see it here yes. It looks something like this, and it will give uh, in other and in other scales. So this is a, a scale which has no no sharps or flats at the, at the at the key. But if I play the, the same scale, for instance, in in uh, in E in me, uh, and and call it mi fa sol la si mi fa sol la si do re mi, it needs to have a, it needs to have a, an F quarter tone sharp. In this, in my system, so it 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 gives completely new key signatures, and uh, and a completely new feeling. But the nice thing about it, I think, is th that is the the resonance is still uh, the resonance of the instrument isn't any longer twelve tone with wrong tones in it, but it's just equal division of quarter tones and and uh, and twelve tone equal. So that was my point for today. <laughs> Okay, so this is, I have, if someone is interested, I can have, I have my, my other microtonal guitars here. Uh, first a question, if that's okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, first of all, really beautiful. Um, <clears throat> and uh, are you based in Amsterdam? I'm based in Paris. Paris, okay. Since 40 uh, years. <laughs> um, so is this primary primarily linear? Have you investigated different chord possibilities off of this mode? Uh, what I did now, what I did now was primarily linear, just to 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 have like to give a horizontal impression of the intervals. But the way you can you can just uh, uh, well, it's not preferably linear because I I did some chord arpeggios like like uh, which of course can be can be. You can you can make like a kind of arpeggio preludes and set all set all kinds of chords and it's it's uh, it's I think it sounds much better in this way than it than it would be like like having a a normal a normally tuned guitar and have quarter tones and then and then uh, it just it fits your fingers also better. Oh, okay. But, uh, it's it's it can be just as chord. It can be just like a, a real classical guitar piece in in Villa Lobos style or so. You know? if, I, if I play Villa Lobos, that would be like a, <laughs> kind of ridiculous. But you can imagine a, a, you can very well imagine Villa Lobos like pieces in in the, in this uh, system. Cool. Yeah. Uh, let me just uh, introduce um, Wim Hugoverf because nobody said his last name. And, uh, you know, Wim used to come to New York periodically and play all kinds of different tunes. So, like, you know, I'm a little stunned to hear you focused on quarter tones all of a sudden because I, I've heard him do 16th tones. I've heard yes. him play in Korea, um, play Dowlin's tuning when nobody on the planet seems to be doing it, you know. And so, uh, uh, but it's interesting. We keep falling back that the quarter tones, you know, no matter how pedestrian, you know, their reputation among microtonalists, uh, some of the greatest music that's ever been written is still uh, certainly a, a quarter tonal in the microtonal realm. You know, or whether it's Ives or Habo or Carrillo or um, Vishnagrodsky, and I mean, of course, they all did other stuff, but but that's still core. Yeah. Well, I, I would have loved to prepare more, but I was. I, this was just impossible for. I'm not. Uh, it's already. Uh, it's already okay for me now to be here. It was very difficult. I had a long day of of other concerts, just playing normal, ordinary music. And uh, thank you so much, Wim, for, for making yeah. the effort. Appreciate. Can it. I ask a question, Johnny? Uh, Michael, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Wim. How are you? Ça va? Hi. Fine, Angel. Fine. Yes. Uh, I have one question for you. Um, 
Are you pretty sure that nobody else has premiered the uh, Alois Haba suite number one for microton for quarter tone guitar? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm very sure of that because the 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 the, the person the person which I contact which contacted me from from Prague. Uh, I was the very first person who who got in touch with him, telling him that that uh, that I played the Haba Suite, and um, I I I know I know there is um, after this was already like in nineteen um, I I performed the suite for the first time. It was in in around ninety or so. In 1990, the, the suite number two, the, the one that you recorded, the, the suite yeah. number two, yeah. yeah. And so, for the suite number one, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, this is the only quarter tone piece I played from from Haba. Oh, okay. Well, uh, 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 just it's kind of like an announcement here. We will be premiering that in next uh, next year. Uh, it will be a surprise. Uh, Johnny will will tell you more about it, but uh, it will be it will be great. And uh, I, by the way, I love your recording of Alois Haba, Suite Number Two. Uh, Thank you. Everybody can check it out. Yes, yes. And uh, well, uh, I'm glad that you're here. You made it. Okay. <laughs> I can show I can show uh, I can show my other guitars, which are, which I have, which perhaps are are. Uh... Because this, this is the this is the guitar which actually served for uh, for downlands tuning. You know, so it, this is the guitar, the same guitar which which uh, John Schneider had as well, and it has the great advantage that the the frets they are infinitely movable. So I can just I can just. Um, I can just take take a. A small piece of wood and and uh, take a, take a fret and move it. You see, I said it. I said it right here. So this this guitar really allows any subdivision of the octave. It it uh, it realizes any tuning, and I can uh, I can set uh, twelve tone equal. I can set Werkmeister. I can set. Uh, Everything, but I think you know you you all know about this this guitar. What's um, what's yeah. the lim limit of, of uh, proximity? In other words, if you had two notes in a scale that are nine cents apart, obviously that's not really playable, right? What, what's, yeah, okay. What's, I, what's I, I the understand. closest they could get? The closest you can get is is around an eighth tone. An eighth tone. Okay. Yeah. So when when the two frets when the two frets uh, meet completely. It's still, it's still uh, unhearable. It's, it's about the, it's about the comma. So, uh, of course, I cannot, I cannot set like a, a thirty-one, a thirty-one uh, equal because it's, um, I only have twelve frets, uh, oh, right, twelve frets right. within each octave. Right, right. But, right. but these 12 frets I can set to any value you, you want. Yeah, any subset. And uh, I did actually my recordings of the um, of uh, Ivor Derek's pieces for 19 tone guitar are played on are played on this guitar and I, I, I used all the I used all the frets which were on the on the highest part of the fretboard and push them just right and push them in so I cut I cut all together like 19 frets in every octave and that allowed me to play the, to play these pieces wow. Wim, I know what you mean I have yeah. a par I have a parking lot up by the sound hole where I leave all yeah. the ones that are waiting yeah. to swoop down <laughs> I see what you mean yeah yeah wasn't it Ivor Darg who said he would have nightmares or dreams where he kept trying to add frets to extend the scale and would wake up with a complete fretless? <laughs> I believe that was Darg. So Maybe out, yeah, that's, that's very well possible. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So thank you, Wim. Um, okay. Thank you. Let's bring in Al Justo now.
I know Al. Um, I believe Johnny was the first person who told me about Al or John Cattler, but Al also played the Fretless Guitar Festival with me. I think the second one, he blew me away with his Mean Tone Blues. Now, this that was a while ago. This guy's extended. He sent me something recently, an extended EDO, which was more atmospheric. So again, this is a guy who can play all different ways. And I believe he's also a New York police officer now. Do I have that correct? Uh, South Portland, Maine. I'm in Maine. Oh, sorry. Now. Sorry. That's all right. You're New York to me, but South Portland, Maine. Oh, yeah. So don't mess with him. All right. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Al Justa. Yes. Well, it's great to see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of new faces. And of course, as, as it would have it, I went, uh, I thought we were playing yesterday. So I go, I log on to the zoom and I'm like, where the hell is everybody? <laughs> but, uh, and then Friday, of course, as it happened, my, uh, my looping pedal that I use broke so that's fantastic so th the last record that i did can you guys hear me all right because i'm going through my uh yeah so the last the last record that i just did the diabolus abientium that i sent to you was uh my combination of ligety um and frippertronics which is what came from terry riley right his looping thing so i found a looping pedal that i could uh decay so the loops work just like frippertronics um so my loops will come in and then they will slowly disappear as new loops would uh, happen. So it just made it where everything was just morphing into something else. And I used 72 ET from which I learned from Joe, Joe Maneri at New England Conservatory and Dave was there uh, during that time. And um, so I went back to a 72 ET on that one and I used my uh, fretless guitar. And of course my sound here going through my love, my zoom sound is not working well, so I could just show what I have on my guitar live, but I don't know if it's going to come across well, but, um, so what I was using for, for that record was a Hamer sustainer, my lovely nineties grunge metal guitar. How's that better? Yeah. So I, I have, um, a couple, like a delay pedal, tremolo and stuff, but it was nice having the, the sustainer so I could. So I can get this, you know, the sustain infinitely going and then looping all of that over each other and creating those, those soundscape kind of ideas from Ligeti with, with the Fripp kind of stuff. So it was fun. I tuned my guitar to an open E minor chord with the G uh, uh, 16 cent shop. So I have a pure, pretty much E minor chord. And then, you know, you just have all the sustain and feedback stuff that you can do on this, which is kind of nice. So. So, you know, stuff like that, that, that worked on there, but without my looping pedal, I can't get all the, the layers going in. So uh, I also play with, um, so when I met Johnny, I didn't know anything about pure thirds or pure major or minor thirds. And he ruined my life by teaching me that. Thanks buddy. And, uh, so once I found out that I didn't realize 72 was mimicking just intonation, I just used it as like a 12 tone system, 36 note rows, 72 note rows. And then once I realized those, those pure thirds, I just, I just love having those in there. So when I play blues, even like a, uh, like a rock blues duo, I'm always using fretless guitars and I tune my open strings to 72 ET. And then I play all my intervals with 72 ET. So when I go to, let's say an E minor chord to a G chord, my G is up 16 cents. So I adjust everything uh, to mimic just intonation and mean tone tuning. Cause at, at that time, I think when we met, I was using, uh, I might've been using 31 ET or chord of common mean tone. So by knowing the difference between now, you know, your G sharp and your A flat, I will use those subsets into my 72 ET to mimic uh, mean tone and to mimic the just intonation. So if I'm playing regular blues, I'm sliding my chords up 
to the now I'm not just going from E to G at the third fret, you know, 12, 12 note ET, I'm sliding that up 16 cents. And then if I go to my B flat, my B flat's now up 33 cents, and then my A sharp is down 16 cents. So I do the blue scale to 72 ET to mimic it that way. And then if I'm doing classical stuff, I do the, the same thing, the modern classical. I'll use those intervals too to base it off of stuff and then use obviously new ones that you can create with that. So I've done it on that. I did a record on that. And then my other fretless is this lovely three string cigar box guitar, which is kind of cool. It has a... It's just tuned to my son's favorite tuning, Dad, D-A-D. -D. And it's it's kind of it's kind of fun because it kind of gives you like a let's get rid of all the effects. Kind of gives you a little bit of a cello sound. So if you want to play in tune, you can, and then you can always have the newer. So it's kind of a fun little fun little instrument as well well to use and that's pretty much what I've been doing microtonally even when I play fretted guitar and play the blues um, I always slide my notes up either 16 cents 33 cents adjusting it to the chords that I that I need even on fretted stuff so that's kind of what I've been doing it's fun sorry I don't have my looping pedal well, very nice. And I remember one of the striking things about you the first time I saw you live was that you play fretless with a slide. So, yes. And I always, I either use a small slide or a big, you know, my big slide now. Yeah. I just have, I just need that thing to sustain. So I have this constant fight with my fretless guitars. But it was, uh, I still don't have a fretted one. I would like to have some fretted ones. I know John, I saw his guitars. They were awesome. We played a guitar micro fest. I'm like, well, what? I, I just found another place that's doing like Rankin's uh boards similar to that called i don't know i just saw them online micro microtone guitar or my something like that and they look like they're doing interchangeable fretboards do you know what it is john was talking about it yeah that's exactly what it is called microtone guitars and they are available there's even some cat in spain which is making interchangeable fingerboards too nice. with the microtone guitars they've got cad you can send them any scale you want and they'll just have they'll cut it and fret it and bam send it to you it's amazing perfect that's what I, that's what i'm going to do next i got to figure out which guitar i'm going to do it to but i need exactly. some fretted ones that's awesome thank you all right. Well, very nice, Al. Um, does anybody have any questions for Al at this moment? Because if not, we will keep moving. And no, I just want to say beautiful. Beautiful, man. Thanks, Dave. You've been I, always, I would uh, just say hi to Al. Hi, it's, Johnny. You know, it's always great. I was at his wedding, you know, I mean. Oh, my God. A long time. That and, is a long uh, time. I do want to put this out there. Does anybody know what happened with Mark Rankin? The oh last no. The last I spoke to him, he came back east to Virginia for his family. And that's like, geez, I was in Brooklyn still. So that's at least twenty years ago. All right, so that's the person who had the uh uh patent yes. for guitars and uh, um not for basses. Somebody else has it for basses. Did he buy the patent? Because he certainly bought all of the old stock, which he sold in kits, and then he ran out. Right. Yeah, yeah I think he had, he, it was a big thing. I think it was Stone who gave him the patent. Of course, of course, yeah. So, Al, now that you're in law enforcement, can you bust people for playing sharp thirds? <laughs> <laughs> I, I arrest every bluegrass violinist I see. <laughs> Please welcome Radio Personality and Grammy Award winner, John Schneider.
I'm so excited to be with you today. Um, I'm going to rush. This is the so-called Lou Harrison guitar. Uh, the instrument itself, because a lot of today is going to be about hardware, right? You'd love to play microtones, but how can you do it? This is a historic instrument. This is, it's now antique, but it's the first interchangeable fingerboard guitar, right, from way, way, way back when. Yes, they went out of business in 1985, and I still got a few. Uh, luckily, Mike Kadurka is making interchangeable fingerboards again, microtone guitar, so we're all going to be very happy. Uh, let's go back to one of the first adapted guitars, Mr. Harry Parch. Oh, yes, yes. So what we have, I'm going to play just a little bit for the uh, Barstow guitar. Uh, this guitar is adapted. It still has a G. It still has a B. They've just moved, and now they're doubled with octaves. And instead of going down to a D, he goes down to an E flat. stuff. So here's a little bit of Barstow, the first two hitchhiker songs. Number one. It's January 26. I'm freezing. Ed Fitzgerald, age 19, five foot ten inches, black hair, brown eyes. Going home to Boston, Massachusetts. It's four and I'm hungry and broke. those frets. But each chorus has a different fretting on it. Oh, Harry. Of course, his original Barstow guitar had removable frets. He got tired of frets and after a while decided to make a fretless guitar with some interesting markings on it. This is the adapted guitar number two. And all of those crazy triangles uh, actually refer, they're colored of course, because they refer to just intonation intervals. Actually, everything I'm playing today, except for one piece, will be in just intonation. So, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to play not a piece of parts, but a piece that I wrote for this guitar. And it's based on, basically, it's inspired by Li Po, the great medieval Chinese poet. And this is a setting of one of his poems. is lazy, the moon bright. Sitting near a recluse places pale white cheen.
and suddenly... As if cold pines were singing. It's all those harmonies of grieving wind. No one understands now. Those who could hear a song this deeply vanished long ago. What would Harry say? I don't know. Bravo, 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 bravo. <laughs> I'm sure people have a lot of questions, so please write to me or exactly. hopefully to any of our artists. It's a pleasure exactly. playing for you. Looking forward to everybody else. <laughs> well, now we're moving on. Uh, Melly Waiters, if I'm pronouncing your name correct. You got the yellow sunglasses. Um, he's a Dutch microtonalist. His most recent thing is in 88 equal divisions of the octave, but I know he did a opera with uh, Johnny and some other people. And uh, I think I heard you playing a big band a few years ago playing microtonally. So this guy does it all. Um, and I'll turn it over to you. But one question, you did send the video. Uh, would you like me to play a little or do you want me to just share it in the link and you can talk? Uh, I'm not planning on playing. I don't have the guitar with me. So if, if you could just do a little snippet. Yeah. That would be nice.
so a um, little bit to start, I think uh, like a lot of you guys, I also started with the fretless guitar and ventured into microtonally fretted guitars a little later. Uh, when I, the day I, I graduated from the conservatory uh, and I was doing a lot of free jazz, I, uh, I decided to rip the frets of the guitar, you know, finally to be free. And I did some, some um, explorations, some free improvisation for, for a while. And then I realized if you want to play some music, you, <laughs> you need to uh, work on your intonation. Uh, and then, of course, the question is, what is intonation? Uh, how do you even intonate? You never learned that as a, as a guitarist. So I got some sources, um, David Doty's book, um, Genesis of Music, um, Barber, um, all that stuff. And yeah, I, I got so much um, interested in the whole microtonal world, whether it's just intonation or uh, equal temperament. And I feel uh, at home in, in both um, worlds. Um, I still do play the fretless guitar, not as often as I like, but I focus on 31 equal temperament and 41. And I, I like them both and also because they are so different from each other, they're, they're like, uh, they're like, well, closely related, but they are like uh, the opposite. So what, what uh, everything which is good in one system yeah, is pretty bad in the other and the other way around. So um, I'm based in Amsterdam. I'm, um, I'm working at the uh, Heidelberg Fokker Foundation. So I got also um, involved uh, with the Fokker organ, which is like a really nice opportunity to, to play with such an instrument. And even um, the yeah, even in the Netherlands, your choice of a microtonal system can be uh, a little, um, how do you say? Uh, I can't find a word. Um, when I said I was working on a 41 tone guitar, people looked at me like, are you sure? <laughs> we, are in, <laughs> we are in 31 land here. Uh, but still, I, <laughs> I uh, took, the, uh, I kept my, my choice and uh, now I work with both of them. Um, the guitar you saw in the video, it's a 10 string. It has um, 82 frets, so that's a lot of metal <laughs> going on. Um, and what might be interesting for you to know is that I tune the guitar in uh, uh, five limit major thirds. So it's a totally different way of tuning the guitar, uh, which means that I have to learn everything from uh, scratch again. So all the muscle memory from my 12 ET days, they are in the bin. I cannot use them anymore. And I start started to learn everything from scratch scratch again and I think yeah it was a good choice <laughs> um what is it uh, can I ask a question yeah sure uh, by the way absolutely beautiful performance of the, the instrument the chords you were digging out of that and and it, on that note I wanted to know what is it you find most uh, appealing about 41 what is it what is it you're finding and digging up in there in terms of the resources it has to offer yeah, what I really like is um, it has so much <laughs> uh, and um, um, it is a Pythagorean system. So it has the plain old, uh, uh, you know, seven note diatonic scale. Um, and then from every one of those seven notes, you have like three different intonations. And so you have your major third, it's, it's you know, most people would say it's, it's too high, uh, but it's, it's a very, very 
good sound, especially on, on guitars. If, if you play them on organ, it's kind of harsh, but on guitar, it's absolutely no problem. But then you, you also have the five limit, you have the seven limit, uh, you have the 11 limit. So there's a lot you can find. And uh, yeah, I think it's uh, because the system doesn't take out the syntonic comma, it, it puts you in a different direction already. So in, in a way, I always um, see 31, you know, as a little easier, easier to understand, easier to use because it takes care of the problem. But in 41, the problem is still there and you have to deal with it, which, which puts the music maybe in different direction. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Oh, can I ask a quick question? Um, what happened to Seaman Terpster? He's a friend of yours, I believe. Yes, yes, yeah, he's fine. Yeah. yeah is he still doing anything? Uh, yes, he is enjoying uh, his life offline. <laughs> mm. um, you know, before COVID, I saw him uh, every week. Uh, now, after a long time, we are planning to pick up uh, uh, our contact. He, he lives just, you know, eight kilometers away from me. Mm -hmm. um, so I've, I've got a meeting with him this week. And we're going to yeah. start. He was also a good friend of Mark Rankin's. Yeah. And he, yeah, might, he, actually, he might actually know where Mark Rankin is. No, there. he doesn't. No, oh. no. I, no, I he doesn't, he... John. Uh, I uh, I talked to see him just uh, two days ago. Three days oh, really? ago. Yeah. Yeah, I talk reg regularly to him now because that's the only way to reach him is by telephone. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, you got to know, Melly, I, I begged him. I mean, I really, it's like trying to get someone to take vaccine who doesn't want to. I begged him, please, I need to talk to you, you know, not just by a telephone. So many things I want to send you, but Seam is an amazing guy. Maybe, Melo, you want to tell him about him, and we'll have him, he's on Moo later this uh, year. Oh, he yeah. is, good, good, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Seam, of course, has an, an immense knowledge on everything tuning related from, from the Asian ancients until uh, the present day. And if, if I don't speak to him for a while and I call him up and then he says, ah, I was working on something new. <laughs> and, uh, he has his mind on 31 tone well temperament right now. So in a couple of days, I'll get uh, the update on, on, uh, on that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, thank you very uh, much, Melly. Um, anything else you'd like to add? I'm just trying to stay on target here. No, we're... no, I'm, uh, uh, no, I would only like to say that at the Heirons Fokker Foundation, we've got a little festival coming uh, the 12th of December, mm. um, where we will also have Tilton with David. So I'm looking forward, David, to see you there. And um, and I uh, me too. I hope <laughs> I, I hope that um, nothing will happen to uh, to your guitar or uh, anything. So <laughs> my worst nightmare would be to get a phone call. You have to sub for David Dornick in Silton. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted hey. to I wanted to ask you something, Melle. The yeah, piece sure. we've heard, it, beautiful sound, by the way, and uh, beautiful piece and great cat in the background, of course. Uh, <laughs> and the piece, uh, the, I heard like a second guitar or something in the background. Mm -hmm. Was there like a, 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 a second guitar or, a, or an effect going on that had yeah. a, a counterpoint? The, the piece is by the Canadian-German composer Todd Harrop who yeah. graduated from the Hamburg uh, Hochschule. Um, he, his project was, was about uh, non-octave scales, so Ball and Pierce, and for example, this 88 cents equal temperament. And he wrote this piece for me, and I, I start the piece with a loop. So I, I take two rounds to, to set the harmonic framework, mm -hmm. and then the melody starts. Yeah, now it and makes halfway, sense, but... But the loop yeah. was like a different kind of sound. That's why I was irritated. But yeah, it makes sense, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Irritating. Uh, 
No, not irritated. I'm sorry. In German, it's like yeah, something like that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Not irritated. Oh, and uh, uh, in, in the melody, when the melody starts, uh, there is a, also a dual pitch shifting on the melody. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. in the delays from the melody, there is some pitch shifting going on, which adds also a little uh, harmonic texture in the melody. Yeah. So. And of course, this is by Todd Harrop. Yes. Which I don't think we've mentioned his name yet. And uh, I, did. I just did. Just now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I just missed him. <laughs> uh, I think Wim had a question. If Wim is still there. I just want to say hello to Mello because we are we are compatriots, but I'm living in Paris, he's living in Amsterdam. We are very aware of our mutual active activities, and uh, and I hope sometime we'll uh, someday we'll meet for real yes. in Amsterdam or in Paris. Yes. Who knows? <laughs> uh, thank you all. It was nice to see you and hear you, and uh, let's meet in in the the real world whenever when we can travel all around and. Uh, Take care, everybody. Uh, Definitely. Thank you, thank you for and being I will, here. I will think of you as a sub for Tilton now you said. Oh, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, bye bye. Bye. All right. So, bye continue, bye. continuing on, even though it's 4 59, we still got two of the best in the world up. Uh, next up is Stephen Jenks Taylor. Now, if you don't know this guy, Look him up. He's uh, studied with Irv Wilson. He's a Hollywood composer of the highest order for decades now. I first heard him, I believe in 99, on that fretless guitar album that uh, Ned Evett put out uh, with Bumblefoot. I think Dave uh, Frusinski's on that too. But anyway, that's when I first heard Stephen James Taylor, but he's much more than that. Um, I'll turn it over to him and he will enlighten you. Uh, thank you, Michael. I Appreciate the, the introduction. Um, what I'm going to uh, play here today is a very, very short piece that uh, is written in 31 tone equal temperament using this guitar I had made for me by a company called Halo. And uh, it was kind of an act of greed because I wanted everything. My friend Chuck Junkie also had one made at the same time. It's got five pickups. Three of them were magnetic. One of them is a piezo, and one of them is a 13 pin uh, uh, for uh, the Roland uh, acoustic modeling synth. So, like what somebody was talking about earlier, of uh, being able to, to to do a drop tuning without having to actually retune the strings, that of using that pickup affords those kind of uh, those kind of approaches. Uh, I was going to play it live, but in our sound check, we, we couldn't uh, couldn't get it working right. So what I did was made a little quick time movie with no visuals. And uh, we'll, we'll play you this, uh, this short two and a half minute piece, which was the, uh, the main theme for a, a, a movie that I, I wrote the music for called South Side With You. It was uh, premiered at the Sundance Festival, Film Festival in 2016. And it's a, uh, it's a film about uh, Barack and Michelle Obama's first date. And stylistically, the movie is kind of a cross between my dinner with Andre, oddly enough, because it's a, it's, it's a conversation movie where, where very big ideas are being discussed between two very smart people who don't always agree. Uh, and a love story. So my, my dinner with Andre is a, is a love story. And so um, I scored most of it in 31, uh, with, with this guitar kind of playing the, uh, the main theme. Um, th there, are, there are ways to really push the envelope in 31. I did not do any of that. Uh, it's the, the, the harmonic language of this piece is unapologetically pop. Uh, and really, you can almost think of it as sort of a 12, uh, you know, 12 tone, quarter comma, mean tone with the extra notes in 31 used for embellishments and sometimes being able to pick between what size major second or what size seventh uh, you, you want to use. Um, but uh, anyway, I'll just, uh, uh, oh, oh, one of the things I wanted to say about also using microtonal music in, in film scoring, it's very, very tricky. I've been, I've been on a sort of stealth mission <laughs> for the last 30 years or so trying to 
weave it into the vocabulary and the vernacular of, of harmonic and melodic vernacular of, of film music uh, hasn't really caught on. One of the reasons is the, the one thing about microtonal music that's really obviously microtonal is it draws attention to itself. That's why we all like it. <laughs> it, it catches our attention. When you're writing music for film, the music is a second class citizen usually. Its job is to support the narrative, to stay out of the way of the dialogue. It has to kind of fit in, right? So it would be like being a string player, you'd have to kind of blend into the section. You don't want your instrument to be more bright and harsh than the, than the ones around you. you know? So it's the same with music for film in, in general. And there is a school of thought, which I don't agree with, that says music should be felt more than heard, you know, in the sense that it can really frame a, a scene emotionally uh, without drawing all the attention to it. Like, hey, I'm here. Um, and so I found that the times I really get busted by directors and producers for, is when I've stepped into using 11s and things like that. Uh, unless there's something going on the screen that really warrants something that does jar you. So this, uh, th this piece is something that I think to the uninitiated microtonally would find, they wouldn't even consider it, they wouldn't even hear it as a microtonal piece because of all the consonant thirds, uh, you know, five limit type things. Uh, but anyway, it's called uh, Walk With Me and uh, uh, I'll play it for you and take any questions you may have afterward. Beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. Uh, like, uh, I, I forget who it was here who mentioned earlier, it might have been William Anderson, about, you know, being interested in the bridge between what people know and what people don't know, the, the known and the knowable. I think everybody here on this call represents explorers into the, un the unknown, right? We've all spent time digging into these different systems. Uh, but the, pub the general public doesn't know, you know? 
And at the end of the day, I think Michael Vick was saying, you know, it's, it's about the music. It doesn't really matter. I, I, where I'm at now is I'm, I'm thinking, well, why even think in terms of scale, right? I mean, unless, unless that's what you need to, you need the specific limitations. But there's a whole other school of thought that, that I'm drawn to, which is grab the scale you need when you need it for that particular phrase. It doesn't necessarily have to be a piece in 31 or a piece in 19. Um, uh, that being said, the limits of those things oftentimes uh, give rise to the rewards of the very same limitations. So true, so true. Does anybody have any specific questions for Stephen? Yeah, um, Stephen, awesome. Thank I mean, you. everything you do, I, I already wrote it. I'll say it again. Mood of mood of Neptune. I just I worship that piece. It's incredible. Um, kind of halfway through, there was like a that was those slides or those were slides. They sound like glisses. Um, and that was sometimes just you know going from one size interval to an, to another. It was usually slides of three or four frets. Uh, that just was like like somebody was saying earlier, the the, the the tuning system kind of changes your way of phrasing. You know, right, Neil? I mean, you wouldn't think of that on a on a twelve tone if you were playing the same kind of thing on a on a twelve equal guitar. You you wouldn't have it. It wouldn't give you that. Right? That's the whole way I teach tuning systems yeah. is that it makes you react differently each one, each I, interval, even each note. You know, I, I have another piece. It's in 34. It's kind of a doom metal piece. And because of the structure, how is it done? God, I think one measure of 25, another measure of 25, and then a measure of 18. It just came out that way very naturally from the riff it's not hard to play but if you start counting it it's like oh it's but that's just because of the the riff in 34 and it, that's where it came out right right i wouldn't i wouldn't think of that in 12 tone in a million years right. oh your standard 2020 i mean it's your standard 25 25 18 of course <laughs> are you trying to zap or something <laughs> <laughs> so are, are there uh, producers that are willing to go with you uh, with the more obvious microtonal intervals? Yeah, you have to kind of um, nurture that part of the relationship. That's where John Schneider comes in because every year he would put on these uh, Harry Parch concerts at the Red Cat Theater. And I always made it a point to bring a different director each time so they can actually see the whole <laughs> thing in its natural habitat, you know? Like um, I could imagine a Stanley Kubrick being uh, enamored by microtones but yeah. I guess there are there aren't too many kubricks left in hollywood but Not too many charles burnett who i've done like 13 films for he's very open to it um, nice and uh so i, I he, he just kind of stays out of my way which is those are the people we love right the ones that kind of just let you let you do your thing but i, I did a, a, a animated series that was a spin-off of the lion king in the 90s called uh, timon and pumbaa and, and so Craig Brady built me a seven tone scale based on a, an African uh, scale uh, called uh, Zavala from, from, the, from a village in uh, Mozambique. Uh, and so I had, had a, a wind instrument made, a pan pipe to those and then tuned my synthesizers to it. So uh, quite often you would hear a cue that was in this weird sort of uh, J.I. scale uh, that would, that would uh, that, I, that is, by the way, it works very well in animation because you're doing crazy, uh, you know, it, it, it's zany, right? It's supposed to be fun and funny. And microtones can be very, 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 very funny uh, against, against picture. Uh, right now I'm, work, I'm working perfect. on uh, something for Mattel that I'm using the 31 guitar all the time. And, and I you're, getting the, you're getting the right segment of the population, the kids. The kids, right? They, they, yeah. they hear these things, right? So, yeah. Uh, uh. <laughs> hey, Stephen. Yeah. You, 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 this, this is a little off the subject, but I know Emil Richards was into microtonal music years ago as a studio guy. Did he ever yeah. get anything into some movies, or do you know? Not very much. Uh, Emil was a good, a good friend. I worked with him quite a bit. 
And he was one of the first people I approached about microtonality because I had his book, The World of Percussion, and it had Herb Wilson's 31 tone vibes in there. And I said, what the hell is this? So I called him and he started talking ratios and it went right over my head. Uh, but, you know, it planted the seed and, and later we reconnected on that. Um, but yeah, Emil met with uh, Jerry Goldsmith and Elmer Bernstein, tried to kind of convert all of them and none of them quite got like how they would use it. I think part of it is, you know, uh, in the past, what's checked people at the door is, uh, is the, the math. They get kind of intimidated by the math and the fact that there were no instruments. You had the, there, there's no, nobody on this call or no microtonalist I've ever met who's not an inventor of some sort, either software inventor, you know, everyone's had to saw a pipe or wood or, you know, refret a guitar. Everybody somehow gets their hands involved in some sort of re-engineering of something to, to be able to hear the sounds that we want to, the, the, the notes we want to play. So, uh, uh, but Emil, Emil uh, uh, toward the end of his career, right before he retired, he had three uh, metallophones made out of uh, brass pipes in, in 31 equal. And uh, he, he drove them over one day and said, I want you to have these because you're the only one in the business that would know what to do with this, you know? So I have these wonderful things hanging on the wall that I, <laughs> it's nice to have three instruments, acoustic instruments in uh, 31. So you can use them as wind chimes. Well, that's, that's how people generally use this stuff. That's about as far as you got was, you know, a little sound of quarter tone sound effects and things like that. But I think that's changing with the software that people like Marcus Hobbs and Super Rock sing and, and uh, 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 odd, odd sounds and stuff like that are, coming out with, I think it's going to make it a lot more accessible to a younger generation of uh, composers to, to have access to scales none of us did back in the day. You know, you, you had to build it by, from scratch. And uh, now that stuff is readily available or at the fingertips. And, you know, that's, uh, I, I, I just think the whole thing's going to blow up in a good way. I love the optimism especially in a dark world that we live in optimism is the key <laughs> talk about dark i mean i don't understand why um a lot of micro isn't used in like horror movies i mean yeah. ultra uh, chromaticism i mean can you imagine like you know jaws like dun 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 with dun, some like you know that and that science fiction the silence, the silence of the lambs, of the lambs or, or it, it. Right. Well, don't, well, forget, don't forget that, that at the beginning, beginning of Let There Be, Let there be Blood, Blood, there was, there was quarter, quarter tone yeah, clusters yeah, with strong. string orchestras. So. Well, what about, well, what about, the, what about the shining? Ligeti. The shining. Yeah, 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 Pender, right? right? uh, Penderetsky. Penderetsky. I know everybody, when they, they listen to music or like the microtone, like that could be great in a horror film. I'm like, Awesome. Let's do it. Yeah, Give me yeah, money. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There it is. There it is. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to weigh in on this. Um, uh, I did play a sound score for, with a new band once for a, a horror movie that came out uh, called Nightmare. Uh, not to say that that title hasn't been used in various ways. And, um, you know, I remember the repulsion of having to play a multiphonic when the knife uh, strikes and the blood spurts, you know. So it did happen. Not that I would ever want to do that again, yeah. but but then uh, there's a, a review just came out of Dune, the new movie, where uh, the fellow is getting all this attention in the New York Times uh, for adding uh, odd instruments, uh, odd ways to play them, but nowhere did it say microtones. And here yeah. they're making this big play, you know. And I haven't heard it, uh, but I do know the topic well. And and you know, uh, they're making this big play about finally somebody comes into Hollywood and makes a difference in a fantasy supernatural kind of uh, format that's appropriate because it doesn't have Western cliches in it, you know, with traditional sounds. I'm going, what is wrong? Yeah, you know, okay. Stephen, you are exactly what they need. Because, you know, uh, you know my take on it is that um, you know, for a sound score composer, you're very visceral, right? Usually we think of sound scores not to get in the way of the film. Right. I'm sure you heard that. All the time. All the time. So, but, but you're so visceral, you know. It's like, it reminds me of Stravinsky. He writes a ballet 
but it works without the, the ballet. Yeah, right, right. No, it's, it's interesting. In, in 1992, I, I uh, was approached by an experimental filmmaker named Eames Demetrius, who was the grandson of Ray and Charles Eames, the famous designers, and definitely cut from their DNA. He does not think normally. And they had, he had just done a film called The Giving, shot all in black and white, a very unusual multi-level story, but he, uh, he had just thrown out a score because the compo he didn't know this was what happened. The composer wrote it in 12 ET, like everybody does. And this was a movie of ever that demanded something different, it its own DNA. And I had just uh, started working with Earth and I was working with combination product sets. And I, I had like a 16 bar piece that took me forever to write. And when they came over to kind of interview me, they were like, okay, yeah, this is good. And all right, whatever. Uh, can you play me something? And I said, well, here, how about I play you what I got right here? And after a long description of what they were looking for, they heard three bars of that and said, that, that, make the whole score like that. And, and they disappeared for three weeks. And I wrote the entire score on using uh, the Epnome Continent, which is a co combination product set that has 70 tonal identities, 58 discrete tones. And, uh, and they loved it. They loved it. Even the, one of the mixing engineers said something went on in the room because of that, because those, uh, all those sum and difference tones were all within, you know, the same sort of J.I. Uh, world. And that kind of messed my head up because I thought, oh, this will be the first of many. And nobody else ever came back, uh, you know, for, for, for things like that with that request. And the movie ran for like a week at the Lemley Theaters and then that was it. I don't even think you can find it online anymore. Um, but, uh, but it got a couple of decent reviews as a, as a sort of unusual take on, um, uh, on, on the subject matter, you know, but, uh, but I think that's all going to change. I think, I think more people are opening up. I met a guy at the max of uh, the cycling 74 max conference a couple of years ago, who was, who was, uh, had written some microtonal max patches he was using in, uh, I don't know, some cop show or something or American horror story, one of those. And he had written a really cool patch that was able to take a note. You could play one note in, and it would it would generate either the harmonics or the subharmonics. Mm. It was very visceral. I mean, shit happened to you like right away when he moved that dial. You know, it was like, ooh, <laughs> too bad that's not commercially available. But, um, hey, yeah, yeah. Uh, just for you and and uh, the rest of the guys who would like to to do something in, on the cinema, I'm leaving in the chat window um uh, uh some information regarding a film mexican films called uh, el premio the prize yes which uh uses only microtonal instruments nice. <clears throat> the soundtrack right so uh yeah uh, be sure to to get the english version on amazon the prize okay i'm i'm, I'm giving you the, the 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 link on youtube i think it's the, the spanish french version but anyhow just for you to have it all right oh, I'd guys? Love to see it when when was that done 2011 2011 el, el premio el premio the prize yes by paula paula it's actually the the life of her under the dictatorship of barella in argentina in the wow. seventh yeah and so the instruments right. used are uh, 13 sounds on Neil trece instruments okay, so Neil trece right right yes yeah so uh, where are you located? Where in Donde and Mexico? Where, where in Mexico was recorded? You mean? Was, or where are you? Where are you operating? Oh, right now, oh, actually, I'm I'm in Rivière du Loup, Quebec, very far oh, away. Quebec. From okay, all right, long way away. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I was I was down in Cuernavaca many years ago and met Oscar Vargas Leal, who was yes, a, yeah, the so harpist. Yeah, yes. and he showed me his instruments. And it was, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice meeting you. Steven good, Taylor. Good meeting you. Mucho gusto. <laughs> Mucho gusto. Next up, and and the final is probably I consider the modern innovator of microtonal guitar. This this guy's unparalleled. John Catler, the one and only John Catler. Even though he has a multi instrumentalist brother, Brad Catler. We're talking about the microtonal guitars right now, so it's a focus on John. I I heard about John. Uh, let me see, I was trying to figure out microtones. The internet came out uh, late 90s. This guy came up and uh, from there, it's just been a watershed for me, but he's been around since the late 70s doing this. He has his own company, Freenote Music. 
they have guitars, all different, t you know, temperaments, just intonation, all all different kinds. So without further ado, I present John Cattler. Okay, thank you so much, Michael. I appreciate it. It's been a fantastic uh, opportunity to sit here and listen to all the different players and the different approaches and the great music. It's something that, you know, Johnny and I would have been thrilled to think that this would happen 30 years ago when we met. Um, I told the story in the first uh, Mew class that I did about um, practicing in my friend Gary's uh, garage. He uh, had a big garage with a shag carpet. He had turned into the band room and um, he let me practice in there sometimes. So I was feeding back and listening to this beautiful feedback pitch, which was not, I didn't have a fret for it. It turned out to be a harmonic seventh. And um, at the time, you know, it was the 70s. There's no internet. There's no way to, to know and find out what that pitch was. So it's been a long road since then of uh, trying different tuning systems, 19 tone, 31 tone. Um, we developed Ultra Plus, which added JI to standard 12 tone. And um, the latest system has been a 24 fret JI system, which seems to be easiest to play so far. And we still have the deal with G&L guitars. That's a 20 year deal where they send us guitars and we uh, get them without any frets or dots. They're nice enough to pull them off the factory line for us. And we put the frets in where the, the people want or where they should go according to the nodes and stuff. So um, all the journeys through the different tuning systems has been extremely helpful because without 31 tone, I never could have juggled all of these different pitches per octave that led to the 64 tone guitar. So getting over the you know idea of being stuck in 12 notes per octave has been essential. But then again, like last week, I was back in New York City playing with Lamont and he's using 12 notes per octave and uh, based on uh, Indian stuff. So that's been something different because he gets tremendous mileage out of the notes that he uses. In fact, I've never seen a better demonstration of tuning than Lamont's well-tuned piano. Um, so if you guys want to check out something, that would be worth checking out. But again, the different approaches you guys all have is just is just fantastic. I, some, I used to wonder, you know, is there a way for different microtonalists, you know, Johnny and I would travel and we meet people from different lands, but they would have a different fundamental or they would use different notes. I mean, it was, is there any common ground for microtonalists to jam on? Because jamming is the way musicians develop these languages. So on the new guitar, we do tune to A440, as it seems to be a ubiquitous uh, tuning ratio, tuning frequency, but there's all these other frequencies and they're all just like all the approaches today. All of these other tuning reference frequencies are worth investigating. All of these so-called sacred frequencies they're all worth investigating because we're at, you know, basically an early stage of evolution for humans about finding out what vibration means. So when we're in New York, the subject came up that, oh, you know, JC likes to tune to 528 hertz. And there was a famous engineer there and he just could not get with the fact that any frequency was superior or different from any other frequency or had any different place because he had listened to sine tones consistently. And he said, well, I never felt any different no matter what sine tone was playing. And so, you know, there's people like that and there's people that really think, well, a couple of, you know, cycles per second does make a difference. So all those approaches are valid since we don't know and we're trying to gather information, we're trying to find a line through that makes sense. So what I did early on was that, you know, I had learned, I had gotten some information from Ivor Dareg very early on. And he, he would say things like Johnny mentioned zonk. Well, Ivor used the word zonk specifically for 19 tone equal temperament. He said 19 tone, as Neil has shown, has a lot of zonk to it. And 31 tone, as Stephen's beautiful piece just showed, can be very calm and peaceful, more so than a lot of other equal temperaments because it has so many JI intervals there. So um, what I wanted to do was, when I was at Berkeley, I had had this guitar that um, Ivor helped me uh, get, and it was 31 tone classical guitar. And I went to my acoustics of musics class uh, a couple weeks later after I'd been playing the guitar, and the teacher said, look, if you ever heard music in a harmonic series tuning, you would run screaming from the room with your hands on your ears. You could not stand it. And that, I didn't hear anything else in that class. That just stymied me. I was like, well, nature built the ears, Nature built that tuning system. How could they conflict? It doesn't make sense. 
what he was referring to was trying to modulate like 12 tone does all over the place using only 12 just intonation pitches. All right, there you're gonna get some wolf tones and some commas, which has plagued mankind forever. The solution to that is just use more pitches. You can, or use the comma like Michael Harrison and Lamont do as a musical interval. And, and since just the nation is not beating, you can add those beats with commas and what we call vibratios to add some you know, shimmering sounds to things that aren't beating. And then you have contrast between true consonants and true dissonance. You have the whole gamut. And you can have, uh, you know, what Lamont does is called the drone state of mind. He gets into this Indian music drone state for two or three hours, and it can change your physiology. It can change lots of things. But I heard Michael Vick's piece recently, and he's changing constantly, and that's almost its own drone state of mind, you know, because you're, you're never landing. You're constantly being surprised by the sounds. And so, you know, I like to do the whole gamut. I like to do the drone state, but I also like to do chord changes that are extremely, you know, hard to play over. Like, you know, Coltrane had his version of chord changes that was in giant steps and they're called Coltrane changes. So I did a piece called Footsteps where I kind of took giant steps and combined it with a three, four time of a, a Wayne Shorter piece, Footprints. And we came up with this traveling, which is um, moving up and surfing the bend. So as the pitch, the fundamental is slowly moving up, you're going with it. And if it's moving down, you're going with it. So we first did this on that record uh, that Neil was kind enough to hold up recently, the Cow People record. Uh, back then, I did not have a word for harmonic rhythm, which is what you do when pitch moves down and tempo goes with it. And um, we had to invent the word polymicrotonality because that's what we used. Um, and I didn't have a word for traveling, which I do on Cow People. It's, it's playing with the bend. So all these years later, it kind of came full circle after I immersed myself in you know, natural sounds, I wanted to find out nature's tuning system and use that as, at least so I knew what that was. I figured we should know what the eighth to 16 scale sounds like and use it in regular music of different kinds and just so we can hear nature's scale. So that led me to wanting to hear more of nature's properties. I wanted to listen to what, you know, a lot of musicians, they don't, they talk about problems, but you know, very few of us are actually searching for answers. I think a lot of people here are, I think one of the answers that we can provide, or I can, is if you look back to nature, it will point the way for you because that's what the American Indians did and it, it helped them you know, form communities and some of the first democracies we ever had you know, with, with the Haudenosaunee Indians. And so I, I wanted to look at things like Fibonacci series. How does that sound? I mean, if nature is making our ears, which are a spiral, Nature's creating galaxies, which are a spiral. Our DNA is a spiral. How does that sound? So we translated the Fibonacci series into overtones, and we found out it's a three-part spiral. Um, and I, as I sped up the Fibonacci series and learned to play over it, I was amazed to discover the Fibonacci series chord progression is a traveling chord progression. It's constantly moving up one notch at a time and constantly traveling higher. So... Um, we kind of put some of these discoveries into, during the pandemic, we had to shut down the studio and couldn't have clients in, except for the, we started clients again the first week that Neil was in Boston, so I missed his gig and I'm still disappointed. But um, for the past year and a half, the only recordings I could do were with my own band. So we developed some of this music and uh, I'd like to play a piece for you now from, from that. It's, it's, no one's ever heard it yet or seen it, but um, this one's called Wolf Trap. And um, after a four bar introduction, we go into the, the spiral, the three part spiral. And this is pure Fibonacci spiral, just translating those pitches into overtones. Um, I take the first note, um, Babe Borden takes the second note on organ, and Hansford Rose playing the third note on the bass. So we can hear the spiral as it progresses, uh, goes up the numerical progression. And it turns out that even though the spiral is in three parts, the chord progression of the Fibonacci series is in two parts, it's in two. It resolves up, you know, a perfect fifth. So um, up a perfect fourth, down a perfect fifth. So we had the drums play in four against our three-part spiral. Then later in the piece, you can hear harmonic rhythm, and that's something that's even less known, I think, than um, harmonic tuning. Harmonic rhythm says, if you 
if you, I, I used this before in, my, in the class we did, the one hertz system is kind of like your litmus test. You can see all the pitches and how they relate by putting them in this one hertz system. So if you have one hertz, that's just, uh, say a low C, it's beating one time per second. Two hertz is an octave higher, it's beating twice per second. Three hertz is the perfect fifth and that's beating three times per second against the two. Seven hertz is the seventh harmonic, it's beating seven times against the two. When you start playing these pitches, assigning the, the pitch to the rhythm, you come up with a time chord. It's a cascade and that every note has its own place in time. So in the middle of this piece, we do go into a harmonic rhythm where the drums will stay in four. Uh, I think the organ's staying in four, the, the bass is in three, and I'm traversing from seven to nine to seven over six, and then back down. So um, I guess we can play that piece for you now. It's called Wolf Trap. Uh, it's not too long, but it, it does show a couple of examples. So Babe Borden's going to hook that up for you now. Soprano has to crash the guitar party here. Yay! <laughs> Always one soprano in the bunch, right?
Nice. Wolf trap. Yeah, I mean, uh, sorry if I can just jump in here real quick. Awesome and always great to see you. And the knowledge you have far surpasses any microtonal knowledge I have. And the ascending stuff and the the rhythms just just really great, great. Thanks, um, Fuse. Appreciate that. Yeah, awesome. One more time, John. That was very very cool. Thanks, man. Bye bye. Does anybody have any questions for John after that? John, it's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I'm hey, thank you, Stephen. Big fan of the Fibonacci series and on, on multiple levels. My my workstation is actually built to the Fibonacci specs, but um, really, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, what, what uh, tuning were you using? Was that a, a, a JI? guitar or was it actually to a Fibonacci scale? Fred, Fred. It was tuned to 24 fret JI. So okay. um, it's basically a 13 limit scale. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we budged a couple of pitches that were very close to Fibonacci pitches. But the, the beautiful thing about the Fibonacci thing, it, it kind of accounts for variation. So it doesn't have to be perfect. And that, that's why every, everything and, you know, everything comes out different. It accounts for slight variations. and. You know, right. Yeah, the, the spiral thing is fantastic. Yeah. Oh, thanks. And no conch shells exactly the same. Right. Right. And the, dif the <laughs> differences are beautiful, right? Exactly. Any other questions for John? He is a wealth of microtonal information beyond the guitar. Uh, yes, so. I don't have a question, but I wanted to say something. Except, of course, uh, this is. This is, was very cool, and uh, thank you for sending me the CD uh, uh, of your band uh, back then. That was a very inspiring CD. You know, the one that looks like it's a building, but it's actually a fretboard. <laughs> right, yeah. Ooh, that's very cool. Yes, I just you. wanted to inform you that uh, your two of your necks are in very good care and use. Beautiful. I love to see that. Well, thanks, David. Yeah. Uh, this one especially has seen a few very oh yeah very beautiful. cool moments and very nice stages and uh it was in uh yeah i did a lot uh, of tuning of the frets and the neck and it served me well and uh yeah thank you again for in uh, because if it wasn't for you i wouldn't have uh, had the possibility to delve into this kind of uh madness and so yes uh I owe you one, John. And well, yeah. uh, thanks for Thank keeping you. the tradition alive and, and, and progressing it so well. I mean, of, much of appreciation course, uh, here. Of course. I would echo the same thing that David said, and I still have my uh, 12 tone Ultra Plus, which I play all the time. And oh, it, great, Brad. That was a guitar that got me into, into microtones. So, yeah. Great. Glad Thank to you. see you're still, uh, still doing it so well, man. That was, that was beautiful. Thank you. Like I said, John is the man. He's the one who got this thing going. Somebody was saying in the 80s and 90s, nobody was innovating guitar. Well, people were. We just didn't know who they were, right, Stephen? <laughs> I think he, I think you said that, Stephen. But yeah, John was there. I believe you were there too, Stephen, pushing it. So I well, know I was, but 19, I was a kid. In February 1978, Guitar Player Magazine had an article with Ivor Dareg with the white hair and the cheap Sears guitar with a million frets. And he was the guy that had already done everything. So we, you know, we visited him in California, went out to Glendale a few times, and he would have things like, a, I don't know, a 17 tone marimba underneath a, an acorn tree and the acorns would fall and bounce on the marimbas and uh, just weird banjos and everything in different tunings that you could ever imagine. And he was so generous with his time. That was what was awesome. And I, I sense that same spirit here tonight, the same spirit that Tillman Schaefer gave me a 31 tone that I still have. That spirit of sharing the knowledge that everybody has, that's what's helped everyone uh, progress, I think. You know, and you can ask Haverstick about something or, or Johnny or, or Michael or any, any of you guys, and, and it's a different viewpoint than someone else has, and it all, it all helps, uh, helps us all learn. So that's been really great to see over the years.
Yeah, that's that's very true. I mean, in my early days, before I even knew the word microtone, I mean, it was you, John, who communicated with me, and then Johnny Reinhard, and then soon after was Neil. So by that yeah. point, I knew the term microtone, even though I was playing them, I didn't even know what it was called. So yes, you are correct in what well, you're that, saying. When you when people intuit stuff, it's just as valid as when people do it intellectually, if they get to the same place, you know? I play I play with the drummer Rock Alam Bob Moses and he doesn't want to hear about the numbers. He wants to hear, you know, the leaves in the in the wind combining to fill up the space. So because he's taken that to its extreme, it works perfectly with my approach because he's intuiting everything. And like I said, the result I think is the same. Definitely. Michael. Yes. I have a question for, for actually for you or, or and John Cattler as well, or, or any other fretless guitarist. Yes. So, guys, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask this out of pretty much ignorance. I have a I have a fretless electric, but uh, I I almost don't don't use it. If you wanna if you wanna approach the instrument with the, with the Stanley Jordan technique, how can you get good tone out of the 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 tapping hand? Put it that way. The tapping hand. Yeah, like like if you for example, imagine that you oh, have. Yeah. Two fretless at the same time, like Stanley Jordan. I mean, the Stanley Jordan technique per se. Not that he uses fretless, but I mean the two guitars at the same time. And so, for for the tapping hand, for for you know for the right hand, or uh, when whenever I do it in my fretless, uh, the tone is not that great. Maybe it's because my fretless is, is a cheap one. It's, it's not that great. But I mean, what would you recommend to to get a proper tone? I mean, I tap on mine, but my suggestion is thinner strings, super low action. If you're using distortion, that helps. But if not, have enough volume. But I know what you're talking about. It's a dull tone. Kind of, kind of dull. yeah, like, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Kind of dull tone. Well, yeah. the, the one point, I know John will have a comment most likely, but fretless guitar is not the same as a regular guitar. I never approached it the same. Mm -hmm. So technically i go for a different thing on that so the dullness i embrace that and then i just try to make it better i don't try to copy a fretted guitar because that's what i was trying to get away from i'm going to avoid it fretless guitar don't bring the same technique create new technique mm -hmm. I mean, can, you do, can you do like uh like something similar can would you be able to achieve in the, in the fretless electric something similar to the polyphonic style of Stanley Jordan. I think Michael's making a good point there that using the, using the instrument for kind of what it naturally is accustomed to or its nature is. But if you really wanted to tap on fretless, which I have done, I would first suggest getting a better quality fretless neck because there's a lot of different qualities and some of them are harder than others. Okay. And second, I would suggest getting a I wouldn't make the action too close. I would make it a little higher so that you have a, you know some velocity mm -hmm. that your finger can get. And then thirdly, I would get a compressor with an attack switch on it. So you can okay. dial in the attack and, and also the uh, sustain on the compressor will bring out each note. So if you get the right compressor and you can experiment with them, bring your fretless to the store and do, do your tapping and find out which compressor either has a blend knob so you can blend in the natural attack with this or some compressors uh, like have an attack knob on them as an addition okay. to sustain. Okay. If you crank okay. that attack knob, you're going to be cranking up the percussive effect of your finger on the fretboard. Okay. And that combined with the sustain should improve your tone uh, a lot, I think, on the fretless for tapping. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The other thing that uh, I've never been able to really figure out is I like to have my nails a certain length because I do like finger picking. It doesn't work when you're tapping. Oh, I actually yeah. found my own way of, of, of getting the two techniques. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Oh, good, good. Okay, okay. Teach me. Teach me. You know, because yeah, I have long nails too. It's how you attack it. Yeah, I like having a lot of flesh hit it, and that means you got to make the nails short. But then you can't use it on, this way. You know. The, 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 whenever I I do uh, uh, electric guitar, uh, you know Jordan Jordan stuff. It, what I what I use is the Malmsteen neck, pretty much like the the, the uh, scallop, oh. the scallop, yeah. yeah. And so uh, that's that's how I pretty much solved the problem because yeah, I was struggling big time. I also play a lot of of, of uh, 
classical per se. So that's how I solved it and, and, and keeping my nails safe. But also I find a way to nail my, my uh, to, to uh, file my nails in a way that I, they will not get compromised big time, no. The, the way I meant it is like I'm I really really dig into the 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 fretless sound of you guys like 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 you and 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 and, and uh, John, and so I was just thinking how how can we ap approach this instrument on a more polyphonic way as Stanley Jordan did back in the '80s with the standard guitar, and without compromising that much the tone that that was that was. Just, right. just no and, and I should add that I, I've seen Elliot Sharp play some fretless guitar where he's doing his tapping thing. And okay. he's, getting, he's getting a lot. And he's using a MXR Dynacomp, I believe, as his compressor, oh. which doesn't have an attack knob on it, but it has enough sustain that it's juicing up his right hand. Mm -hmm. And he gets a good sound, I think, on the, for fretless tapping. Yeah, and I have pretty cheap equipment, and I get a decent tone um, on the Glisten Tar. It's better, but at the same time, it's different. So I accept that. When I play John's fretted 24 just, it's a hell of a lot easier to get right, a Stanley right. tone. But it's a different instrument, so I don't judge it. I'm like, okay, that's easier. But the fretless, it just takes practice and the suggestions that John is saying will make it easier for sure. Yeah, yeah I'll try that with the compressor. Th thank you guys both. Sure, and I even went farther. I put a sustainer on my uh, fretless. So <laughs> that helps, you know, bring out the nature of the legato stuff and that's that's nice yeah does anybody have any other questions for for john have we reached the limit what do we go for almost an extra hour <laughs> that's okay that's not microtonal or at least it's a hell of a wide interval uh, an extra hour so um do, do you have anything to add johnny Reinhardt? Uh, no, I think that's just wonderful. Uh, we can, you know, decide how much really belongs into an edited recording. Uh, but I'm so glad, you know, you've got a chance to ask the questions that you wanted to ask. So that's at this point, key. I think we need to go uh, be able to make some food. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So um, with that in mind, uh, you know, at the count of 10 uh, in my mind, I'm going to end this meeting. And I'll send the recording out to everybody. Uh, Lou, and uh, of course, I'll send it to people who are participating as well. Thanks, John. Thank you all for being here. Thanks, Michael. Thank yes. you all. It was just tremendous. Thank you all. Really.